e-commerce. And uh, we are always thrilled to have one of our partners, People Incorporated, uh, present our classes. And so without saying anything else, I'm going to introduce Natasha. Hi guys, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I, I'm glad to see, see a room full of people here. I'm just going to kind of launch into this. We're going to talk today about how you can make some money online. Um, and we're going to concentrate mostly on the eBay and Etsy uh, uh, websites. But we're also going to talk a little bit about um, Craigslist, Amazon, some of the others. So if you have any questions at any point, please interject. I tend to bounce like a ball from one topic to the next, so don't don't let that don't let my enthusiasm stop you from from interjecting. I love questions. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what I do and and how I come to be here in front of you today. I work for People Incorporated in the Community Economic Development Department. I am the Senior Business Trainer and Marketing Coordinator. Um, so I have the best job of all. I get to go out and talk with groups in public about um, how they can improve their business, create a business, um, some plans for making a business more successful, uh, or how to finance their business. People Incorporated is one of the largest, uh, oldest, and most effective community action agencies in the country. Um, we have been around for over 50 years. We have over 40 programs that we bring into the community. We have lots of offices and a large service area. Um, here's kind of a listing of them. I'm hoping that it looks like the, the uh, camera's nice and sharp, but I tend to travel throughout this area, but my office is here in Abingdon, right down the street. We also have offices in um, Manassas, and uh, I want to say Shenandoah County, maybe? I can't see it. I'm too close. Woodstock. So um, if you're in Northern Virginia, we can also help you out, but we kind of travel all over Virginia. We do have a Facebook page. We like our uh, social media at People Incorporated, so if you haven't liked us yet, please do. And that way you can find out where I am, what sort of uh, workshops I'm teaching in, um, and what we have going on. We also uh, put our our businesses, the people that we have assisted with getting into business or with making their business better, we try to share your um, your achievements and advancements. We have a Twitter feed, which is a close approximation of our Facebook feed, but a little different. Um, I take care of one and my associate Andrea takes care of the other. If you have a small business stream and you need money to make it happen, that's what we do. Uh, we finance inventory, equipment, capital improvements, uh, cash flow. We can even refinance old business debt to help you to uh, kind of get rid of some of those high interest credit card debts. A lot of people start their business on a credit card. And then what seems like you know a great and very manageable amount of money at the, at the outset kind of starts to snowball on them. So give us a call. We can help with that. We do business loans up to $250,000 for, uh, for any of those things. We do training and technical assistance, so we don't just give you some money and then send you out there into the world. Uh, we're a community action agency, so we, uh, we want to help you to make your business successful. We can actually do loans of up to a million for tourism-related businesses when we have funding in our um, night district account. So that's specifically for tourism-related businesses. It has its own website. These are our business development managers who can help you with any of that. Jeremy's in the office with me over here in Abingdon. Leslie's in Woodstock. And Jenny's out in Warrington. So give them a call if you need some assistance. Uh, consumer lending is actually where um, the the uh, Economic Development Department started with People Incorporated. We had a program called uh, Money for Cars, or no, Cars for Work, that was the name of it. And what would happen is people in this region would want to get jobs. They want to go to work. They want to be uh, useful, successful members of society. You can't get anywhere here without a car. It's very, very difficult to improve your lot in life without transportation in these mountains. So we have this program where we can help people get cars so that they can work. Um, 
since that program has grown and morphed into the consumer lending department. And what we do is we do personal loans, sir, with an affordable interest rate of prime plus 5%, um, with uh, up to 36 months to pay for uh, household expenses, a car for work, bill consolidation. One of the things that we've really moved into now that we're really working hard to put an end to and to help with is the predatory lending practices, the internet loans, the title loans, the pawn shops, this sort of thing. Where we see uh, interest rates, well, we had a fellow in a few weeks ago who had take a loan out on a vehicle, very nice vehicle. He was working and didn't foresee any trouble paying it off. It was a $600 loan. The vehicle was worth significantly more than that. Seems easy peasy. Well, when he came to us, he'd been paying on this $600 loan for months at the rate of 500 and some odd dollars a month, and he only owed $1,400 now. Um, we started doing the math and discovered that he was paying 1.96% interest compounding daily. You can't get ahead of that. We were shocked, um, but we've since found out, because this was such a shocking thing to us, we've since found out that this happens a lot. Um, so we are trying to kind of be a source that is preventative of that predatory lending practice. And the person you would talk to for that here in Southwest Virginia is Ms. Evelyn Taylor, who has 40 plus years of banking experience. She's a doll, she's in our office. Or Jenny Knox up north. We also do individual development accounts. Uh, individual development accounts are a program uh, through the state and uh, several other entities that facilitate a pattern of regular savings and education in personal financial um, uh, learning so that you can learn to build your personal savings. You can learn to be more financially savvy and be more economically secure in the end. It's not a loan. Eligible participants have to meet certain qualifications. They have to have uh, income limits, etc. cetera. But uh, they receive training, they receive support, and for every $1 they save, they make a match of $8. So up to $4,000 in savings. Now this money can be used at the end of their program to buy their first home, to start a business, or to send themselves or an immediate family member to higher education. So if you know someone who might benefit from this program, please send them to Gail Lambert, who's in our office right up here, who can help get them signed up for it and get them on the way. And then there's me, training and technical assistance. This is literally what I do. I go around and I talk to people, and it's wonderful. I work with business basics groups. I work with community groups and chambers of commerce. Um, and these are some of the classes that we offer. We have a full schedule on peopleincorporated.eventbrite.com. So please get on there, take a look, see if there's anything that you might want to attend in the future. If you need a workshop or if there's something that you have an idea for that you think might be wonderful, ask. I, um, I'm always happy to receive an email that says, hey, I'd like to do this, but I didn't see where you all do that. Send me an email. There's a good chance that even if I haven't done it up to this point, it's just because no one's asked me to. So here are some quick success stories from community economic development. 2,388 participants have been trained in financial literacy microenterprise, or have received one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. We have uh, provided 92 business training events in the past year, uh, and we have 5.2 million total dollars lent out by our ninth district, that's the tourism-based business funding, uh, since the inception of that. 36 new multi-funded loans, that means that the money comes from a variety of resources, uh, various programs that, that we pull together. Average loan size is about fourteen or about $15,000 um, for almost a half million dollars out there. 43 business loans have been repaid in full. We have an amazing success rate for repayment because we provide support. Um, 150 jobs have been created or retained. And that's really, that's the name of the game. We put people back to work, put people to work, 
and they help other people get work. So 24 businesses expanded, 12 business startups, and 27 consumer loans totaling over $160,000 with 29 having already been repaid. So that's, we feel like that's a su success story that we can bring out to our community and in hopes that you all will tell anyone that you know that we may be able to help and continue what we're doing. So now, here's what we're here for. Selling on e-commerce websites. How many of you are already using eBay or Etsy or one of the other e-commerce websites to, to make some money with? Just one of you? A couple of you. Okay, a few of you. Great, great. Well, today, um, we're going to talk about some of the basics, but we're also going to talk about some tricks, some tips, some things that you may be able to use as a strategy to help do even better, or maybe to cross over your business onto one of the other websites. People ask me all the time, I'm just selling some stuff out of my basement on eBay. Is this really a business? Am I in business? Or is this just a hobby? Well, first of all, who here knows the difference between a business and a hobby? I, I know Kathy Lowe does. <laughs> According to a friend of mine who works for the Small Business Development Center, the difference between a business and a hobby is that when you start a business, you have at minimum the intent of making money from it. You may not, in fact, successfully make money from it, and it may not happen immediately even if you do make money, but you do it with the intent of eventually making money. If you are purchasing items for resale with the intention of making a profit, you have started an online auction business. That matters because towards the end of this presentation, we're going to go over some things you might need to know in order to make sure that your business is legitimate and professional and that you're jumping through all the correct hoops and signing on all the correct lines. So eBay. eBay's been around since 1995. Uh, created by a computer programmer. The first thing that was ever sold on eBay was a broken laser pointer for $14.83, which to my mind just proves that there is a market out there for anything you have to sell. Um, there are, this is 233 million. That number has actually increased since this presentation was made and it continues to increase daily. Um, more than 1 billion page views per day, and 95%, this is what matters to you all, 95% of all the people on eBay selling things are individuals or small businesses. So they are people selling things out of their basement or intending to make a profit with, with, with just a small business platform. Three steps to getting active on eBay. If you've never used eBay, you'll have to set up an account. Then you're going to list your item, and then, of course, sell it and ship it to its new owner. <clears throat> now, easy enough to say, but obviously we're going to break these down into their component parts. So the first thing you're going to want to do is set up your account on eBay. You can either set yourself up with a personal account as an individual, or you can start an eBay business account. Now, why you would do one instead of the other comes down to quantity, of course. If you are selling a lot of things, you're going to want to have an eBay business account because it's going to help you to keep up with some of those numbers. If you're selling um, some things that were left over from the last yard sale you had, you might just want to set up a personal account. When you set up an eBay business account, it's going to be very much like registering for an email account. It's kind of that same basic plan where you're telling who you are, where you are, um, and then some, some basic identifying traits like your email address, a telephone number. You're going, of course, to have to check the box that says you agree to whatever. Um, user agreements, privacy, privacy policies, all of these things but you're essentially just signing up for yet another internet service. Easy enough. Now, from there, you want to tell the buyers that you are starting an eBay business. You want to let people know that you have stuff to sell. 
So there are several ways to go about that. The first is to set up an eBay store if you're starting an eBay business. And we're going to concentrate on the eBay business pattern because um, with the assumption that most of you are here because you want to make money. Obviously, most of these things still apply to an eBay individual account. Um, it's going to be very similar. You may or may not choose to have an eBay store if you're setting up an individual account. You may just choose to list your items as, as individual items. So your eBay store is going to let you tell the, uh, the buyer a little about yourself. Um, our kind of eBay guru is my director. We joke that if you leave your jacket laying on the back of a chair, you may come back from lunch and find it on eBay. She is an enthusiastic seller of, of random items. And so she has a little introduction here. She says, thank you for checking out my eBay items. I pride myself on always providing excellent transactions. My items are usually personal items I have purchased or inherited. I've been known to go to the occasional estate sale to pick up items, right? So it just tells kind of who she is. This is her store heading. Also, how many of you here have bought something on eBay? Did you look at the, at the, at the score? Your eBay score is important. Now, you, as a purchaser, already have an eBay score. You've already gotten that started. So you're going to have some positive. You may have some neutral. You may even have some negative. Those are going to transfer over to your seller account, too. Um, she has really good positive reviews. It says, great seller, uh, fast shipping, ring is beautiful and exactly as described. So that's about the best thing anyone could say about you in, in terms of your eBay sales. You can put a cover image up here, much like you can with your Facebook page. Um, most of you, are, are, are all of you familiar at least with Facebook? Because I use that as kind of a go-to reference a lot of times. Um, but yeah, you can, you can add a big background image. You can add a picture here that kind of gives the, uh, the brand image you want your items to convey. And then of course you have a name. This is Cindy, my director's background image. She has some nice fluffy clouds and then a little kind of pretty frilly thing over here for her profile picture. It's not very personal. It's not her picture or whatever because that just seems a little too personal for business, I guess. So when you create the listing for the individual item, the ring, say, you're going to create a descriptive title for your item. Now, you have 80 characters. How many characters does it take to say silver ring? 10, 15, tops? So, do you stop there? No, you've got 80 characters, use them all. Remember, when someone is looking for, shopping for a given item, the first thing that they look through is the titles. So if I might call what you have a pink dress, that's great. But what if someone else refers to it as salmon? Or perhaps uh, uh, coral or watermelon or peach or uh, rose? Think of some of those ways that someone else might describe your item. Cocktail dress, formal dress, um, uh, dinner dress. Use as many of those as your 80 characters will allow to get the best possible description of your item. Then you're going to add pictures. Well, pictures are a thing, you know. Um, you got 12 of them for free. People are very visual. Use all 12 pictures if you reasonably can because it doesn't cost any more to have 12 pictures than it does to have two. And I'll just tell you, people are more enthusiastic about buying something that they feel more like they've seen in person. Um, that can sometimes be, be the difference between someone buying and not buying, is whether they feel that they had an adequate interaction with your product. So you have 12 photos. This one, this first one up here at the beginning, is going to be the photo that shows in the listing when they just string them all together down the side of the page. 
that's going to be the view most people have, that first picture. So remember, your gallery picture should be the picture that best describes your item visually. Either the most holistic or the most attractive um, picture of your item that you are using of those pieces. 12 is probably sufficient. Describe the item you're selling. Be honest. Be truthful. Be very, very specific. Um, if something is new, that's wonderful. But have you all ever seen that thing uh, where it's like, new dress, never been worn, and then there's a picture of somebody in the dress? Well, it seems like they've probably worn it <laughs> since they're standing there in it. So, new is new, but don't don't, don't be fibbing about it. Uh, maybe it's new without tags or new with effects or pre-owned. It's okay. You know, you can put on there later in the description that you put it on once to, to take the pictures. But be honest. Don't call something, something new if it's not. Um, brand. If you know the brand name, put it on there. Um, People like to have the brand name of things, especially when it comes to uh, personal items, furniture, clothing. If, however, something is handmade, you wouldn't have a brand. Um, model, this applies mostly to um, electronics, appliances, automobiles, things that, that come from manufacturer in mass. And manufacturer parts number. Lots of things aren't going to have that. Some are. Computer parts, for example, will have a manufacturer's parts number so that you get the right one. Cell phone cases often have those. And then you have your description. And it's great to have flashy words and, you know, all kinds of colors and things happening, but that's not what matters. In fact, those can even be off-putting to people who are um, annoyed by excessive visual stimulation. What you want here is specificity. This is where we're going back to, is it a peach, a pink, a rose, a coral, or a, a pink dress? You know, what, what is it exactly, and how might I describe it? I have a gray suit that my mother insists on calling a made-up word. She calls it my grige suit. She says, no, it's not quite gray, it's not quite, gray. It's not quite gray, it's not quite beige, it's grayish. It's, Mama, it's, it's gray suit. But... If she were looking for it, I would probably, and I discovered that it may be a made-up word, but it's one we're now using, apparently. I discovered that when I started painting my house. Um, and so I might describe it in those terms. You know, I might say that it's a, uh, a size 12, but I know that that's a vanity size. It runs large. Um, I have a filigree ring that has what looks like turquoise in it. I know for a fact it's not turquoise. So I would be very honest as I was describing this item. I have a, um, a doll, an art doll, handmade. If I were selling it on there, I would go into great detail about what the materials it's made of are. Because people have allergies, people have, you know, people want to know exactly what they're buying. And this description panel is your opportunity to make sure that they are happy with their purchase and that you get that good rating. Color, size, measurements, item conditions. Here's another thing. How many of you read blogs or news stories of, of human interest nature or that sort of thing? Humans love a story. We are storytelling creatures. This is also a great place if you have a notable feature or a little story to tell about something. I bought this dress to wear to my daughter's wedding. Only worn once for four hours. Marriage is still wonderful, but the dress is too small. You know, um, you also want to be very clear about whether you're going to allow returns. And folks, let me just promise you, you want to check your spelling and grammar. An easy and useful way to do this is to actually write this up in Word or some other um, typing program first, some other word processing program first, and run the spelling and grammar checks on it. Then you can copy and paste it to this panel after you've made all the necessary corrections. 
here's the thing. There's a large portion of the population out there who see it's with, a, with an apostrophe when it shouldn't have and just go off the rails. <laughs> I admit, I used to be an English teacher. I'm on the list. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a reforming grammar fanatic. Um, I try real hard to, to let things go. But you do, you, you do want to check those things. Just because it looks more professional, it looks more polished, if you've used your words and used them correctly. After you've spell checked it, you can copy and paste it in here, or you can write it in here directly. Use the kind of words that you would type in the Google search to look for the item you want to buy or sell. If you were buying this item, what would you, what would you type into the search bar? So make sure that you're using those words within your description. Those are key words. That's how key words happen. Questions? All right, we're all sewed together. I have a yes. The 12, the 12 photos, that's per item? You have yes, per listing, you have 12, uh, 12 photos. Okay. So this is our favorite kind of example of why you should clean out your basement and put everything on eBay. Um, my director was cleaning out her, her boyfriend, now, then, uh, now fiance's home, and came upon this 1974 Planet of the Apes lunchbox that was his third grade lunchbox. He was going to throw it away. She said, no, no, I'm going to put it on eBay. And she did. And it kind of sat there for a couple of days. And then a bidding war erupted. And $117.50 later, they were both grateful to have not thrown it in the trash, obviously. So, you know, it has been very truthfully and uh, explicitly described. This was my boyfriend's when he was in third grade and has been sitting in a closet ever since. Please see all photos for condition. Show some expected wear from a year of school, but actually in very nice condition and still has the thermos. Please email any questions. Now, there are 12 photos of it, give or take. They're all very clear, very explicit. You can see exactly what you're getting. Aren't these wonderful photos? She took them with her iPhone outside on a picnic table or whatever on a kind of cloudy day like the one we're having today. And they look beautiful. Do not think that you have to have some kind of professional light box and, and fancy camera set up to get good pictures of your items. You want to make sure that the background is not excessively busy. You want to make sure that your pictures are close up and in good sharp focus. You want to make sure that there are no glares that are going to distract. That's why a cloudy day is, is just a great gift because you can take things outside and throw them on a bed sheet and suddenly you have a perfect light box out there. Um, but this is a good example of cell phone camera photography. Here are some of the other photos from the listing. Here's the inside. As you can see, it, it is actually a used item that has been carried by a small child for his lunch. However, at $117.50, I think that's great. How many things do we have sitting in our closet that we could, you know, maybe be making money off of? So you're going to have to set a price, and you're going to have to set up an auction. There are some things here that we need to talk about. First of all, is there a price that is the least you'd be willing to let your item go for? Keep that in mind when you set a starting bid. If you're not willing to let it go for 99 cents, don't start your auction at 99 cents. Make sure if you're absolutely unwilling to let it go below a certain price that you set up a reserve bid because you're going to want that to keep people from buying your item for 99 cents. So, buy it now. How many of you have gone on eBay and bought something on the buy it now plan? 
here's the deal about adding a buy it now price to your product. What do you know about the buy it now price? Anybody notice anything about it? It's generally pretty high, isn't it? Compared to what the bidding is. That's because if you're going to include a buy it now price, you need to know that that is the most you will be getting for your item. Why on earth would I pay $117.50 for a lunchbox when I could buy it now for $15? So be cautious about putting a buy it now price. You may want to skip that, at least until you see how it's working because you may actually be limiting profits that you could be getting. How long are we going to make our auction for? Well, we've been told that three to five days is the best length for an auction. Here's why. Any more than that, it kind of falls down the list because it's got so far left to go. You know how when you pull up eBay, kind of the default setting is ending soonest. Well, if your auction isn't ending for seven or 10 days or more, it's gonna be pretty far down that list, isn't it? And if you're only doing one day, you may not have time for it to be found by potential buyers. Three to five days is good. What time do you all think that your eBay auction ends on that third or fifth day? It ends the very minute that it opens that many days later. So if you do this when you are getting up in the morning, first thing when you get to work, you go, well, I've got a computer at work. I'll just set it up on there. And at eight in the morning, your auction ends. Guess what time it is in California at 8 in the morning here in Abingdon, Virginia? It's the wee hours. There's not going to be a bidding war for a last minute chance to buy your item if it ends at 8 in the morning in Abingdon, is there? We know that a bidding war will increase the odds of you getting a better sales price. So you might consider, in addition to your three to five day period, starting your auction at a time when people are more likely to be on the internet. Thus, in the evening, between six and nine, say, or on Sunday afternoon. Now, let's say that your auction is going to end on either a Wednesday afternoon or a Friday afternoon. Which would you think is better? I've never gotten paid on Wednesday. By Wednesday, I'm counting to make sure I have enough money to last until Friday. So maybe if I'm going to be selling something and I want people to feel the most free about purchasing it, I'm going to set it up to end at 9 o'clock on Friday night or at 6 o'clock on Sunday afternoon when sheer boredom could cause you to go ahead and buy something but I'm probably not going to end it at 8.30 on Wednesday morning because that's probably not going to go where I want to go. Now, all listings have to include a shipping service, a shipping price, and a handling time. Again, honesty is the best policy. If somebody gets on there on Sunday afternoon and buys your product and you've promised a 24-hour turnaround time, you have until 6 o'clock Monday afternoon to get it in the mail. Maybe that's fine for you. Maybe you live such a life as to make that possible. But my life is chaotic. And at 6 o'clock on Monday, I may be running through the grocery store hoping to get dinner on the table before I fall over. So I probably want to give myself a three-day handling because in that way, I may get it out on Monday, but I may not get it out till Wednesday, and I've given myself that leeway. And I've not had to disappoint or be dishonest with my customer. So think about in context of when your auction's gonna end and when you're going to really, really be able to get this thing together, get it wrapped and get it in the mail. 
and give yourself enough time to actually do that. Um, shipping service. Well, this is pretty easy because there's a shipping calculator. It's going to help you and your buyer. Remember, this is shared information. It's going to help both of you to know what it's going to cost and how it's going to come to them. A lot of people try to make money on their shipping. Please don't. It comes across as dishonest um, because at the end of the day, unless you legitimately have some concerns for um, how much it's going to cost you to ship something, most likely they're going to see that it's costing you $5, you're trying to charge them $15, and they're going to say, never mind, let me find this somewhere else. So remember that that is shared information and use it accordingly. But there is a shipping calculator that's going to help you to know exactly how much it costs. So here's your handling time, three business days. Think about it. Do you want to accept returns? This could be buying trouble. Unless you really, really want to have to fool with returns and getting money back out of PayPal for people, maybe you just don't want to fool with returns. And that would be my suggestion, is that you just cut the returns off. PayPal is, of course, kind of your standard method of payment. Um, and there is actually a way to block bids from people who might be problematic, people who have very low ratings, people who live on the far side of the world, because it's going to cost you significantly more to ship to certain places. It may cost you so much more that it makes it hard to sell your item. So, you can block bids from buyers who are going to make your transaction with them more difficult or more expensive. And again, much like with the returns, I suggest checking that box. No returns, yes block. Yes ma'am? Where do you put the, uh, if you want to do a reserve price? Uh, it is further down. It's not on this page. I think it's maybe on the page after this. But you're going to start your auction somewhere, and you may actually start your auction below the reserve price, but it will ask you what your reserve price is. I think that when I clipped the pages, it may have gotten cut off. So, shipping details. They're going to make this as easy as possible for you. What kind of package are you shipping? Is it one of those, if you stuff it in here, it goes? Is it a box? Is it um, a thick envelope? What are the rough dimensions of that package? <clears throat> is it irregular? What, what does it weigh, either in pounds and ounces or in general ideas? Is it, is, it a, is it a red box or a house? And then you're going to put in your zip code, your handling fee, and you're going to ask it to calculate this for you. It's going to give you options for several shipping services and several methods, and you're going to be able to choose how you want to send it based on a real-world cost and therefore cost-effectiveness. So that when you set this up, you'll know how much you're charging. You can get the total shipping cost here, the order total, postage cost, UPS tracking. You will get an eBay discount. Now, here's something we need to talk about. How do you know how much to price it for? What if shipping is going to cost you $9.11? What if um, you don't happen to have any clear tape and paper sitting at home to make packaging out of. How do you know how to deal with those things? Well, here's the trick. Pretty much everything we talk about today, every service, every, every item, you're going to take the price that is the least you would accept for the item, and you're going to attach 15%. That is your wiggle room. 15% will cover your postage. It will cover your 2 or 3% that they, various services charge you for the list, for the sale. It will cover whatever 
40 or 50 cents they charge you for the listing. And various services, whether it's eBay or Etsy, whatever, they're going to charge you differently. Uh, they're the same across one service, but the services are different. 15% is a good way to know that you have covered your costs, your gas for taking it to the shipping place, whatever. That 15% keeps you from accepting the lowest bid for your item and then having to pull money out of your pocket to pay for shipping. Questions? So you're saying make your price include that 15%? Yes. The 15% should be... free postage? Is that what you do? Free shipping? Um, free shipping or your buyer pays the shipping. Because here's the other thing. When eBay charges you for the item you've sold, they charge it based on how much it costs shipping included. They don't charge you just the cost of the, um, of the product. You know, oh, I sold this for $15, but it's going to cost $5 to ship it. You pay eBay based on $20. So you definitely want to make sure that you're covering that in your cost. So this so far is not going to be visible to the customer? No, okay. no this is you setting up your product. Um, this is the ship to, ship from, and this tells exactly how much it is. Now, at that point, the postage will be visible to the other person just via this page we looked at back here. They'll be able to see this. They have the same access to this that you do. But none of this eBay fees, and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about. When you list an item on eBay, you're charged an insertion fee. You're uh, charged one fee per listing per category. There are some exclusions. Uh, let me think, books, um, CDs. There, there are some random kind of exclusions that none of these fees apply to. Um, you get a certain number of free insertions per month. I want to say it is 50. Yes, 50. First, first 50 are free. And then you pay 10% of the total amount of sale for a maximum of $750. Can you say that again, please? You're going to pay, you're going to get 50 insertion fees free. You're going to pay 10% of the total amount of sale, that includes shipping and handling, up to $750. Once you hit that 51st item, you're also going to pay 30 cents per item. Now, per month. So if you sold a bunch of stuff this month, next month, none of that, if you're starting on a clean slate. 50 insertions per month. You are credited back if your item sells, because it's no longer a listing. <coughs> the total amount of the sale is shipping charges, handling, everything inclusive. Now, there are ways that you can make it cost more. You can ask for more pictures or um, advanced listing upgrades, uh, supplemental services, but if you use the standard service, it is 10% for the first 50 items. 30 cents added to each item for that. <coughs> Questions? Let me get a little drink. So you can... Go ahead. You can list something 50 times mm -hmm. without a fee. Right. No. Wait. Let's, let's be more specific. Earrings. I made earrings. I made 50 pairs. I can either choose to list one pair 50 times. 50 times or 50 different pairs before there's a fee. No, the end of the month, that rolls over. 50 yeah, 50 listings for free, 50 insertions, 50 of those little line right. items. An insertion is a listing. An insertion is a listing. 
Okay. Where's the 30 cents? The 30 cents is for number 51 in a month. So you're not paying anything to list your stuff on eBay? Nothing at all. Not for the first 50. How do they make money? When you sell it, <laughs> they collect 10% of the sale price. Ah, there it is. And it's 50 per month? Mm -hmm. So you start over again. So you start over again next month, yes. So they get 10% of whatever you sell. Absolutely. Yes. But that includes shipping and handling. To a maximum. To a maximum of seven hundred fifty dollars per item. If you per list, item. If per you, listing. You mentioned where you can list one pair of earrings, but you have 50, 50 in stock. So every time somebody buys one, if you're it an comes individual, off. that's still fifty listings. Now, if you're a business, it's a little different. Yeah, because it comes off each time you sell. It, it comes earrings. off. Yes. And even if it's the same pair of earrings, you have to put it. Okay, so from a marketing perspective, like, I have a friend that sells on eBay and she's like, I just throw everything, 99 cents, and then that's my best way to get a higher return on my investment. And I'm just scared to do that because, like, I know I'm going to be really ticked if I put 99 cents and it sells for $2 and I really wanted, I have, in my mind, I had to have 20 out of it. So would you say... I would never agree to sell something for 99 cents that I was going to lose money on. So you would say I would start even if I started it at 99 reserve. cents, which I, I don't think I would do, but even if I started at 99 cents, my reserve would be $20 plus 15%. Okay, so you say you can start at 99, but have that reserve in there. Yes. And how is it that the reserve protects you again? How do you? When I start bidding, maybe I start the bidding at 99 cents. It has to continue upwards to a minimum of twenty dollars plus fifteen percent, okay, which I've chosen as my reserve, it's or it, the the sale is refused. Okay. And the option will say reserve on a timeline. You set it. Yes. Yeah. And it, it disappears in three to five days when I've set my timeline. Other questions? I heard something else. It'll say reserve not met. Yeah, reserve not met exactly. So you'll still have them. You can start a new. Um, a new auction on them as soon as you're ready to. Other questions? This is always where I get the most questions. Please ask up. Um, we're going to talk about this with each of the services. But on eBay, your first 50 listings are free. You do have to pay for a storefront if you want a storefront, or you can just list them as individual items. Um, and they make their money off of that 10% overall. The storefront is your business name? Yes. Business account. Yes. You're using that interchange with the storefront business. Yes. Thank you. What does that usually cost? I'm not sure because I only sell things as an individual. Um, and it kind of changes periodically as eBay changes their terms of service. The best way to get on there, the best way to, to find out is to get on there and remember that first page that said set up a personal account or set up a business account. If you set up a business account, that's how, or it'll ask you if you want to set up a store setting up a personal account and it'll tell you there because they can't you know, they can't sell you something they'll tell you how much they're selling it to you for so the ebay fees pertain to both the business account yes like the individual yes <coughs> yes now on etsy that's going to change a little bit but on ebay yes it is stable across the platform other questions So, here's the other thing that you have to take out of that 15% besides for the money that eBay is charging you and the shipping. PayPal does not charge your buyer. PayPal charges you. They charge you 2.9% for the total amount sent plus 30 cents. Again, you're going to see that total amount sent. So, if I'm buying something for twenty for fifteen dollars and there's a five dollar shipping and handling charge, I'm paying twenty dollars. They're taking two point nine percent of twenty dollars, not fifteen. Does that make sense? So we want to make sure that we're covering our own expenditure with that fifteen percent headroom over our basic sales price. Say again what the PayPal charges. PayPal is two point nine percent plus thirty cents. That's within the U.S. 
buck thirty cents. Mm -hmm. Now that just transfers. Of course, there are some discounts for eligible nonprofits. International sales are slightly different, but if you've checked that box that says you're not going to sell to people who cost you more, then that international fee is probably not going to matter. Um, and eligible nonprofits is just a little less. But this is when PayPal charges you. This is how that works. So, right, so yes. The seller pays 10% plus 2.9% plus, plus 30, 30 cents. cents. Right. Plus shipping. Depends. You can make the shipping your fee or their fee. That's entirely up to you. Well, that's got to be dealt with as an expense, so you're right. Yes, so it does. So you're looking at what your price plus shipping plus 10% plus 2.9% plus 30 cents on every transaction. Um, Pretty much. Because I would charge shipping to my buyer, Right. Um, my 15% would more than cover it. Okay. That's where the 15% so comes from. You're going to sell a price plus shipping. Yes. Okay. Well, price plus 15%, because what your 15% is actually covering is your 10%, your packaging fees for, you know, brown paper and tape and printing, and PayPal. So price plus 15% plus shipping. Yes. How do you get your buyer to pay for shipping? Because you say um, every the, the buyer's paying for shipping no matter what. You if you look on eBay listings, let's say that you're looking for um, I bought a uh, I bought a set of lights for my RV the other day on eBay, um, and there were probably 25 listings for the exact same product, and they ranged from six dollars to twenty seven dollars. The $6 one had a $5.95 shipping. The $27 one had free shipping. However, basic math tells me that I'd rather pay $11, $12, than $27. So that's part of it. People who are honest about their shipping, shipping is not generally that high. As you all know, there's that if it fits in ships envelope. Um, the post office gives them to you for free. And then it's what four bucks, something like that, to send it anywhere in the country. It's it's a flat rate. So if you can use one of those, you should um, get in contact with your post office. They will be happy to send you some um, shipping materials. But brown paper from the Dollar Tree, labels printed off on clear on plain printer paper, and taped over with clear tape to make them water impervious. Um, and you're not out a lot of money for shipping. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I just did on twenty dollars. If you add fifteen percent, that's two dollars and thirty cents. Yeah. Then you pay two point nine plus the you know, plus yeah. some portion for shipping. Plus well, at thirty cents you're still back to the twenty dollars that you wanted. Right. Which is what she's saying. If you, if you say twenty dollars plus fifteen percent, yeah, because yes. the twenty dollars would be plus three dollars yeah. shipping and handling. Right. The fifteen percent will cover that one. all that too. Yeah, the fifteen percent should cover it. Um, mathematically, it moves with you know it, it moves uh, in relative terms. So fifteen percent will cover it. So to kind of summarize. Think about those time zones when you're ending your auction. Sunday evenings is a great time because you have a big chunk there. Pictures, clear, up close photos. The first 12 are free. Remember that first one is your gallery image that people will see as they skim past. Uh, description, details, details, details. Um, what you're selling, why you're selling it, what's included, its actual condition, and any um, quirks of the product. Title, use all 80 characters. First 50 listings are free until you sell them per month. Any questions on that? All right. 
Okay, well, we've talked about eBay. How many of you are here, how many of you here have sold things on Etsy before? Etsy's kind of a different animal. It's, um, it's got a very specific audience. If on eBay you can find anything, on Etsy you can find the best gift ever. You can win the Christmas party. You can only sell certain things on Etsy. You can sell handmade goods, vintage items over 20 years, which to my math means that I unquestionably have vintage socks, um, and supplies to make those things. But there are lots of things you cannot sell. You cannot sell guns or other weapons. You cannot sell hazardous materials. You cannot sell animals on Etsy. No alcohol, no homebrew, none of that. No pornography, no drugs, of course. And no body parts except for hair and teeth. So apparently one can buy teeth on Etsy, although I've never been in the market for teeth on Etsy. So. Um, but these are the rules of Etsy, as published by Etsy. You do get a storefront, the visual storefront. You get that by joining Etsy. Whereas with uh, eBay, you kind of have to ask for that and pay a little extra for it. With Etsy, it's part of the materials provided. This is just, uh, this, if, if you go to Etsy, this is kind of the first thing you see. You can browse for things or you can uh, look at the pictures and, and choose from there. Um, is, yes. there is there an advantage to use your own name or more of a general? A cutesy yeah. sales name? Um, because on Etsy you're going to have a store, I think it's up to your aesthetic, it kind of depends. I mean, if you want to be known by name as the person who makes this item, that's great. If you want to kind of have, if you have some branding that works with your product, um, then obviously you're going to want to carry that through. Now, if you have a the brand that you use on your website and on your store and then everything, I would keep it consistent because if I come up across, you know, on Etsy, then, oh, yeah, I've been following her on this or what have you. It's just going to improve your visibility brand. across your markets if you're always consistently calling yourself and your product the same thing. I am listed there. I've only sold one. Now, there's a very different audience for Etsy than there is for uh, eBay. Etsy is maybe not the cheapest place to get something. You know, when we go to eBay, we're looking for a bargain. When we go to Etsy, we're looking for kind of that handmade, love-included glamour that, you know, gives all those cute little little country French houses their, their joie de vivre. Um, so it is a very different audience. You sign up for Etsy just like you sign up for eBay, just like you sign up for an email address, just like you sign up for almost anything in this day and age, by putting in your information, coming up with an email, a password, and a username, and then clicking to agree to almost anything. <laughs> you can also sign up using your Facebook if your Facebook is attached to your business. A lot of people before they start with Etsy, already have a Facebook store that they're selling things from or, you know, displaying their items on. So it might be that for you, the quick connection of signing up with your Facebook is, is, is the easiest way to go. That's up to each user. There are no membership fees with Etsy. It's free to get started. It costs 20 cents to list an item for four months or until it sells. If it's only on there for three days, that's when you pay the 40, or 20 cents if it's on there for four months. That's when you pay it, when, it, when the auction runs out. Uh, once you sell your item, they collect a 3.5% fee on the sales price. So you're paying a per item, but you're paying a much lower total. Because instead of 10%, it's 3.5. Questions? This is a um, Etsy store that is um, among the top producing revenue, or top revenue producing Etsy stores of all. It's really cute. This little girl sells these little uh, scarves and these little boot toppers and, and little headbands. Super cute. Um, but it blew my mind to discover how much revenue it produced. 
So trust me, I'm as shocked as you are to find that the number one shop on this list is someone who sells headbands. I'm not a connoisseur, but they seem well made, which I'm sure lends some to their success. But I doubt quality counts solely for the meteoric growth they're seeing. So undoubtedly, her pictures, her marketing is on point, right? We all want to look like this cute little chick who's clearly on her way to, uh, oh, what's it called, Lollapalooza? Something like that. Here's why it matters that what she's doing is working. She's selling approximately 2,300 items per month at an average price point of $28, which is pretty reasonable for, for a fashion item handmade, for a monthly revenue of $65,000, which indicated to me that I'm in the wrong field. Um, unfortunately, I can neither knit nor crochet, so I guess I'll just keep teaching. You can learn. <laughs> For $65,000 a month, I suspect I'd be willing to try. This what, is, this is, is the another one. Can you spell the name of that? The, the, yeah, the site. Three, Three, Bird, Bird Nest. Three Bird Nest. No, I mean the whole thing. Oh, Etsy. E-T-S-Y. Dot Yeah, dot com. Can we share that? your presentation with if anybody wants to like, email me or Jeff? I would absolutely uh, be happy to um, send this out to all of you as a um, PDF so that you can use this material as you set up your own shops. Um, Simple Shapes is another enormously successful Etsy site. Um, we all had these in our offices when I worked at ETSU. We all had these little calendars that took uh, chalk and we had these little trees and Hug our family photos on them. Everybody has them. Everybody's got them in their nurseries. Um, this guy's got them really nicely marketed here. The, the photos are nice. Um, and he's obviously doing a great job because he's selling about 365 of these a month for about 100 bucks a piece, which again, as decor items go, is pretty reasonable, um, for an average monthly revenue of $36,500. Anybody want to get their cricket out and warm it up with some vinyl? He's got his little Made in the USA sticker up there on his web on his uh, page. I say sticker; it's not really a sticker, but you know. Yeah. So um, here's another one that I really like. Um, if anybody wants to, you know, send me one of these. I want one for Virginia and one for Tennessee because I live right there on the lawn. But there are these cute little uh, kind of die cut uh, cutting boards in the shape of states. And they have a little heart at the state capitol. Isn't that cute? So if you're ever digging around on Etsy, lacking a service platter, but really want to represent your state, I live in Tennessee, can y'all tell? <laughs> um, Heirloom has exactly what you're looking for. So they're selling 525 of these little wooden doodads a month. They're selling them for about $48 a piece, which is certainly less than you pay for it in a lot of department stores for a similar item. Um, and, and they're getting by on $25,000 a month. So there's a lot of money out there to be made. These are some examples of Etsy photos that sell um, everything from furniture to jewelry to artwork. What I want to point out to you here is that the pictures are very clear and the backgrounds are not distracting. Again, you want to use your cell phone cameras just fine. You want to make sure you have a good clear background. The light's not too bright. Any questions on Etsy? Etsy's a little easier once you've gotten through all of the, the twists and turns of eBay. Pinterest is a great place to drive traffic to those sites. Uh, Pinterest has just started working with direct sales from the website Pinterest.com itself. Uh, and they're, they're experimenting in a few categories like women's fashion. But Pinterest is huge. Uh, people get on Pinterest and they look for ideas for remodeling their homes or planning a wedding or 
uh, maybe their outfit for a special day or to remind themselves of project ideas. I, uh, I spent a lot of time on Pinterest when I, I recently acquired a 1996 school bus and I'm turning into an RV, so me and Pinterest have been in close cahoots here lately. Um, these are some Pinterest boards people collect. Clothes, products, favorite places, things for your home, things that are just cute. Pinterest is 80% female, the user. The average user of Pinterest, 80% is female, 50% have children. Now, you may be thinking, well, my product is not necessarily aimed toward the female market. If it is aimed toward the market and you can tell a visual story with it, you may want to spend a little time getting it on Pinterest. Here's why. Pinterest users spend 70% more for the same item than a non-Pinterest referral. 70%. These are some possible categories in Pinterest. A lot of people aren't very familiar with it. They go, well, how would I sell my item? This is my dream bathroom. It's on Pinterest. I live in a 100-year-old house. It's unlikely to happen, but we got to have dreams, right? So I want to know how to make my dream a reality. I click on my favorite bathroom, save it to my page. If I click on it again, look where it takes me. It takes me to the fine folks who can sell me the things for this bathroom. It could also just as easily, if it were a picture of a headband, take me to Three Bird Nest. Or if it were a picture of a cheese platter, take me to the people who sell the cutting boards. Or any visual story that you can tell with your product. Cindy just had a new grandbaby. I think she just put this in here so that I would make sure to tell y'all she just had a grandbaby. Sherwin Williams, I think it was. Benjamin Moore. Couldn't figure out how to, how do you sell paint visually? Oh, what do you do? Bucket of paint. Bucket of paint. Different color from that. No. They painted these beautiful doors and they took pictures of them. And that's what they pinned. Same thing with Lowe's. How does Lowe's sell their product with visual story? By creating projects. You can set it so that your Pinterest pins go to your eBay or Etsy website, to your Facebook page, to your website, whatever. There's Cindy's lunchbox that she managed to sell for. She must have found herself a Pinterest user, huh, for $117.50. Questions on that? We're just skiing right through them now that we've gotten through the big stuff. Yes? Back to Etsy, are there different ways to design your page once you... Absolutely. How do you Absolutely. Do it's, it's just like when you're um, creating how you want your Facebook to look or how you want your website to look. You just get in there and, I mean, the, you're limited to some degree, but you decide what the pictures are, what order they're in, how you want that top banner to look, that's up to you. You saw the various, um, and it may be that your best bet is to get with someone who's computer savvy, if you are maybe not, and pay them for that one-off. But yeah, you do have a certain amount of uh, leeway there. You got something to sell and you don't want to spend any money at all, Craigslist. <coughs> Craigslist is easy. Um, in fact, the bus that I'm so in love with right now that we're turning into an RV, I bought it off Craigslist. You can buy almost anything on Craigslist. Don't dig too deep. I literally mean almost anything. But let's say you're looking for a specific thing. You search that specific thing. Here we have sofa. Takes you to some people trying to get rid of an extra sofa. So you're going to plan and research. You're going to find out how much you should be asking for your product. This is the hardest part. Price your item. That research is going to come in handy when you're making all that you can potentially make off of your item. Take some nice clear photos. All the other things we've talked about still apply. Write a good clear headline. Remember, different folks may call something, something, something a different word from what you would use. Write a good, clear, honest description. It's those same old basics. I will send you all this so you will have these specific instructions. 
Safety on Craigslist is important, and I recently learned that most local police stations have set up an arrangement with their localities. Do, does anybody know if we do that here in Abingdon? We do. Awesome. Most of the localities are happy to have you come make uh, Craigslist exchanges in the parking lot of the police department. That keeps you from going to a stranger's home, keeps strangers out of your home. Uh, don't invite strangers to your home. This sounds pretty obvious, but there you are. Uh, be particularly careful if you're selling high value or expensive items. Take your cell phone along. Rely on the buddy system. You really ought to have a buddy with you when you're selling something. Um, and trust your instincts. If something feels wrong, it probably is. So taking these precautions are recommended by Craigslist. Um, and in that way, we're all able to continue to use this service safely. Amazon sellers. You know, Amazon is now opening their doors up to the small and individual seller. Um, I will send you all this instead of reading it to you or trying to make you read it, because I know it's very small from where you're sitting. But it's very easy. You sign up for an Amazon seller account, much like you sign up for an Amazon buyer account. They um, have become very open to people selling as small businesses and individuals. I think they've seen the writing on the wall where eBay was really beating them in a few categories. Here you have 99 cents per item, um, price limit for $10,000 if you're selling as an individual. Uh, professional seller plan, you pay $40 a month, which means that 99 cents per item versus $40, $40 per month on the 41st item you've tipped, you should be selling as a professional. So, um, you get listing order and management with the individual, you get bulk listing tools, tools and inventory, and order reports as a professional. Generally, there is no price limit for professional listings. So, questions? Here's the thing I told you about at the beginning. How do you know you're starting an online business. Well, we talked about that. If you're buying and selling things to make money, you're in a business. When you start an online business, you're going to have to jump through those same hoops like any business owner. You're going to need a legal entity, which is corporation, LLC, sole proprietorship, partnership, etc., etc. You're going to need to choose one of those. You're going to do do, uh, do a DBA, doing business as, if you choose a sole proprietorship. You're going to need to make sure that you're not using a name that someone already owns. You can't very well call yourself McDonald's after all. Um, register with the State Corporation Commission. Uh, get your taxpayer number, taxpayer ID number. Please do not put your Social Security number on every piece of business uh, communications you have for the rest of your life. Go ahead and get that taxpayer ID. Government likes it, and it's for your safety. Um, register with the Virginia Department of Taxation. That seems obvious. Uh, you're going to have to charge 5% sales tax if you're selling things within the state of Virginia. So you can remit that, but keeps you out of hot water. Um, obtain a business license if your area requires one. The municipalities vary. I believe we do require one here in Abingdon, but outside of Abingdon, it kind of, we don't hear. Oh, well, hey, no business license in Abingdon. Yes, no, uh, no, 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 I'm in the county. I'm oh, you're in the, in the county. county. County does not, county. city does. <laughs> okay, there you go. And that's why that's why it's good to know this. You go to your you go to your people who are your municipal leaders, and they can tell you these things. Um, I work all over the state, so I don't always know if I'm coming or going. Um, a lot of places do not require a business license if you're only selling it frequently or occasionally. So, so ask your local. Um, Etsy does send out a 1099, which is a uh, miscellaneous income report, with, which will be part of your uh, tax package at the end of the year. So Etsy does send those out. Uh, PayPal is, report, is required to re <laughs> try that again. PayPal reports gross payments in excess of $20,000 per year, or over 200 separate payments in a year. So. When you hit 200 payments, or when your when your gross exceeds 20 grand, uh, PayPal is going to report that as taxable income. If you purchase items for the resale with the intention of making a profit, you are a business, right? So, 
Anything? I, I just want to go back to the license. In Virginia, counties do not require a business license, but towns and cities do. So you need to check, in most cases, towns and cities do. So you need to check with your circuit court or your commissioner of revenue within your jurisdiction. There you go. Did everybody get that? Yes, ma'am. How do you get the 5% sales tax covered? Is that part of your 15%? Part of your 15%. <clears throat> part of your 15%. Um, at that point, you're very definitely going to want to charge your um, buyer the uh, sales tax so that you've got headway in there, headroom in there. Questions? Other? Then you're losing money if you're, if it's 10% plus 15% plus, or plus 5%. Plus 5 plus well, you may need to nudge your, you may need to nudge your, um, uh, uh, 15% up closer to 20 if you intend to sell in Virginia. Here's the deal. Remember that thing you could check on eBay that says, I don't want to do business with people who are going to cost me more money? That may be where this works out for you. Mm. So, it, it you sales, can check the box that says, Purchaser is responsible for sales tax. Purchaser is responsible for shipping also. Yeah, right? yeah, I would charge, I would not pay my own shipping and I would not pay my own sales tax. I would let the purchaser pay both of those. Yeah. So they get ship CMD? No. How do they pay? When they, when they pay their PayPal, you already know it's $5.62 or 92 cents or whatever it is. You've already done your shipping calculator and you know that it's $5 and whatever to ship. So they figure out the shipping. You don't say it's going to be such and such. Well, it, I mean, you do because because it's already in there. It's On in that calculator. Does. Will you put the ship to? It'll get a while to make the calculator calculate that for you. Even if it's going overseas, I think now they do mm -hmm. that. If it's okay. an international ship. Yep. That's why that calculator is shared knowledge. That's why you don't know anything they don't know as far as that shipping calculator, and you can't really make money but on shipping. But depending on who buys it, it's going to cost different shipping And it's going to give them a different sale. shipping amount. Right. Like if it's a Hawaii or Alaska, it's probably going to be more than if it's... So you just say, when you're advertising your product, do you say shipping will depend on where you live or what do you No, it'll, to e eBay will, it will tell. When you doesn't know who's going to buy it yet. Because when you get on eBay, if I get on eBay right now, it's going to say, my computer is going to ping me in Southwest Virginia. Or I'm going to have to put in a zip code. Probably through your account. Mom, your account is going to tell where you're shipping to. Because when you set up your account, it says address, because you're setting up an account. When you set up a buyer account, you're setting up an account with resumption that you're going to be buying things from them. So it's going to want a shipping address. So if we buy it, mm -hmm. and you're in Virginia, yes. and I'm in California, and you're selling it for $15, you're going to pay 20, I'm going to pay 24. Yes, most because likely. It's that but much. it's going to say that on, on my you, page. It's I'm going to say gonna know 24. You, yeah, I'm not right. going to know that you only paid 20 and I had to pay 24. I'm just going to know that I'm that the base for price was 20 dollars. Yeah. Thank you. And the sales tax thing. Um, eBay or Etsy or whoever those folks are, they report. They report it. Yeah. So you're on your own, yeah. and the IRS may not ever catch up with you. But if they do, if you're they do, pay. you're going to want to have to, you're going to want to have that in an account to pay it. Right, right, right. <laughs> so all of you have a little survey there, um, and I think there's also a link to the survey. Um, Sandy's going to share the list of who all's here with me, and then that way I'm going to be able to send this out to you all. Please fill out your survey there. If there's anything I can do, you also have some materials from my agency and my um, business card. Don't hesitate to contact me. I love to hear from people. Um, if you come up with a question tomorrow that you didn't think of today, shoot me an email. Um, that's the easiest way to get in touch with me because as you can see, I'm away from my phone, um, which on an ideal day, I'm always away from my phone. So please, please let me know if there's anything at all I can do for you. And thank you, Natasha, for everything you've done today. I think this has been a great class. So, so September the 14th is our next class, and it is going to be the second half of Excel spreadsheet. It's the next level. It's a higher level. The next level. level. So, so 
if you if you didn't get to attend the first class, watch it on YouTube. Uh, search Noon Knowledge, and you can watch the first section of that class and then come to the next level for Excel. It was an excellent class, and I, I learned a lot from that class and became more comfortable myself with Excel spreadsheets. Um, just another little commercial, uh, the Business Challenge Team, which is the Washington County Chamber of Commerce, Sandy Rattler's Department, and Virginia Highland Small Business Incubator, are planning for our fourth annual business plan challenge. We have $15,000 in prizes and um, between eight and $10,000 in um, in kind donations, professional, professional services from uh, legal and CPA. If you have participated before and you have not been a first place winner, you can try, try again until you are the first place winner. We've had some great results from this, and uh, Sandy and I uh, have been involved in some conversations with some folks that are working with the governor's office, and they are in, they are becoming interested in some of our contestants. So these business plan challenges throughout the communities are growing, and they're showing some great uh, success stories for entrepreneurs. So spread the word about these Classes. They will begin January the 17th, and we will be signing people up starting in November. I think you can even do it now. The application's on the Chamber's website, oh, wow. so you can start. We also, to kick this off, are doing an Entrepreneur Express on November the 17th here at Virginia Highland Small Business Incubator. And even though Sandy's behind the scenes, I'm going to have her tell you what Entrepreneur Express is. But we feel like that would be a, a great entry into the business plan challenge to um, give people a little more information. If you've never done an Entrepreneur Express workshop, it's a three-hour workshop where we go about an overview of the steps to starting a business how do you finance that business, how you market that business, and we felt like it would be a great kickstart to the to the more in-depth that we're going to get into into the um, challenge. And that's also part of Global Entrepreneurship Week, and so we're kind of using that also as a way to uh, promote the event. But I encourage you, if you even if you're an existing business, um, this is a great opportunity to learn of resources. I, I've been in economic development now, I'm going on 27 years, um, started in kindergarten, um, and it's amazing businesses that really do not have any idea of the amount of resources that are available to them. A lot of times it's free resources, it's just a matter of they didn't know it, so they weren't using it. And that's one of the things we try to introduce, so uh, if you have an interest, go to the VAstartup.org website or call the incubator or the ch um, chamber for any of these. Um, and tell folks, if you enjoyed us, um, tell folks these are free workshops. And, you know, we're proud that we're the only organization in the Commonwealth that is doing this this frequent and also streaming that, allowing folks to kind of expand our footprint. So uh, thanks for coming today. And uh, I, believe, I believe that's all, folks. <laughs> What's the subject of the next one? When is it? Uh, that's Excel. That's on the oh, oh. 14th of September. Then after that will be employment law, and that will be presented by Penn Stewart. Cool. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. Thanks, folks. And thanks on the line. <laughs>